Hi, my name is Siavish and in this video we're going to be talking about the family tree of the Mughal dynasty of India. I'll be using our Asian royal family trees chart which is available as a poster from our website usefulcharts.com. For around 300 years, the great Mughal Empire united the Indian subcontinent and created one of history's richest empires. Along with the Ottomans and the Safavids, it is one of the gunpowder empires. Today, its legacy can be seen in every corner of the Indian subcontinent, from our architecture to our legal systems and even our dining tables. So let's get started. The word Mughal means Mongol in Farsi, and that pretty much gives us a starting point for the dynasty's story. The Mughals were ethnically Mongols, but also not really. The story of the dynasty begins with Timur the Lame, also known as Tamerlane. He was the last of the great Turco-Mongol conquerors who built an empire pretty much from scratch, and at its peak, his realm extended from Damascus in the west to Delhi in the east. While he was, as he called himself, the unconquered lord of the seven climes, he was not a legitimate ruler in the Turco-Mongol tradition. This was because he was not a descendant of Genghis Khan. Both he and Genghis Khan descended from the same people, so you can say that they were distant cousins. Timur married a descendant of Genghis Khan and took the title of Gurkhan, meaning the son-in-law of the great Khan. This is where the actual name of the Mughal dynasty comes from, the Timurid Gurkhani dynasty. After Timur's death, his sons fought each other for their claim to the throne and ended up weakening the empire greatly. With other local powers rising up, the former Timurid empire became a mosaic of various small kingdoms with a few being ruled by Timurid princes. One of those princes was Omar Sheikh Mirza II, who ruled over the Fergana Valley in modern-day Uzbekistan. Omar Sheikh died young in an accident, leaving his small realm to his young son Zahir ad-Din Muhammad Babur. Babur was only 11 when he came to power and immediately he had to root out relatives who were looking to usurp his title. In addition to that, he had a huge threat to the north where the Uzbeks were united under Muhammad Shebani Khan and were picking up territory. Babur kept struggling to survive and was able to keep himself around. He conquered Samarkand, the prestigious Timurid capital, around 1501 but had to surrender it to Shebani Khan along with his beloved sister, Khan Zada. This was quite an insult. Eventually, in 1510, Shebani Khan was defeated by the Persian Shah Ismail and Khan Zada was sent to Babur's court in Kabul in modern-day Afghanistan. Babur had captured Kabul after finding out that his uncle, the ruler of the city, had died leaving only an infant in charge. Only a few years after conquering Kabul, Babur began looking east, towards India. He began raiding the region of Punjab. India was held weakly by the declining Lodi dynasty of the Delhi Sultanate. By 1525, Babur had realized that India was there for the taking, and so he invaded intent on conquering and not merely raiding. In 1526, he defeated the Lodi Sultan at the Battle of Panipat and entered Delhi as the Shen Shah of Hindustan, the Persian word for India. He had barely begun to put together the ruling core of the empire when he died in 1530. The story goes that his son and heir Humayun had fallen ill and Babur had made a bargain with God, his life for Humayun's. Unfortunately, the bargain wasn't as good as Babur had thought. Humayun was not a very good ruler, and on top of that, he had three brothers who were constantly eyeing the throne. He also had leftover Lodi pretenders here and there, plus a huge Afghan insurgency problem. Also, it didn't help that he had a massive dependency on wine and opium. All of this culminated in Humayun being overthrown by an Afghan general named Sher Shah of the Sur dynasty. By all reasonable measures, Sher Shah Suri was as great a ruler as he was a general. He finished putting together the empire's core. He built the famous Grand Trunk Road, which goes from Kabul to Bengal. He also restructured the empire's financial systems into a tri-metallic currency. 
Unfortunately, he died in a cannon explosion accident and after him, the empire began to dwindle under his son Islam Shah. Islam Shah wasn't half bad himself, but he simply had too many problems around him. Meanwhile, Humayun went to the Persian Shah Tahmasp to ask him for his help, which he was given in return for his conversion to Shi'ism, which at least on surface, Humayun agreed to. With his shiny new army, Humayun invaded the Suri Empire and attacked Delhi, the capital. He was able to overthrow the Suris and reinstall himself as emperor in 1555. Though he only ruled for six more months before he fell from his library stairs and died. This left the young Jalaluddin Muhammad, only 13 years of age, on the throne. Jalal had many enemies, but he was able to fight back with the help of his mentor and loyal general Baram Khan. Baram Khan gained a lot of influence as Jalal grew up, but as he came of age, Jalal was able to grab power for himself and avoid being puppets to anyone. Jalal is considered the greatest of the Mughal emperors. He is remembered as Akbar the Great, which is kind of redundant because Akbar means the great, so it's like the great the great. He solidified his control by allying with the Hindu Rajput tribes. He brought them into his empire's fold by giving them official ranks and marrying Rajput princesses. His wife on the chart, Maryam Zamani, was probably also a Rajput princess, but we're not sure. In the future, the Mughal emperors married Rajput princesses, and so by the sixth emperor's reign, they had more Rajput blood than Turco-Mongol blood. Akbar also expanded the empire greatly and redistributed land by creating the Zamindari and Mansabdari systems. Basically, a land grant was given to someone along with a numeric rank, ranging from 10 to 10,000. The Mansabdar with the land was supposed to provide men and taxes. The land grant couldn't be inherited and Akbar moved people around frequently to make sure that they couldn't build too much power in one region. Akbar also created policy to better integrate the Mughals into India and created what is considered an era of tolerance. During his lifetime, his son and heir, Jahangir, began itching to depose his father. Akbar tried to control him by preparing his grandsons, Jahangir's sons, against Jahangir, which sort of started a cycle. Jahangir ascended to the throne after his father's death, primarily because none of Akbar's other sons were alive. Despite being eager to become ruler, Jahangir wasn't a hands-on ruler. His reign is more famous for his wife, Nur Jahan, who wielded absolute power in her husband's name. She is said to have been a remarkable woman who controlled every aspect of her husband's administration. Jahangir was so out of it that he's said to have remarked that he needed nothing more than a kilo of wine and half a kilo of meat. Meanwhile, Nur Jahan was trying to make sure that she remained in power after Jahangir, whose health was declining every second. She started preparing his son, her stepson, Shah Jahan, to succeed. But Shah Jahan was proving difficult to control. She hence moved her attention to his younger brother, Shahriyar. This pushed Shah Jahan into rebellion, which he lost, but he was able to make enough allies to remain in the emperor's favor. One of those allies was Asaf Khan, Shah Jahan's father-in-law and Nur Jahan's brother. When Jahangir died in 1627, Asaf Khan managed to arrest Shahriyar and Nur Jahan. He then prepared to coronate Shah Jahan as the new emperor. Shah Jahan had his brother and nephews killed, but he pardoned Nur Jahan. Shah Jahan was the most Mughal of the Mughal rulers. Most things associated with the Mughals come from his reign. His beloved wife, Mumtaz Mahal, was the niece of Nur Jahan and the daughter of Asaf Khan. Shah Jahan loved her very much, and when she died in 1631, he built the Taj Mahal as a tomb for her. It's said that Shah Jahan isolated himself for weeks and his beard turned grey overnight from grief. He also built the city of Shah Jahanabad, now known as Old Delhi, to serve as his capital. At the center of Shah Jahanabad was the Red Fort, and at the center of the Red Fort was the Peacock Throne. It was a throne laden with jewels and precious stones. At the time, it had cost 10 million rupees, which was double what the Taj Mahal had cost. The throne also housed the Kohinoor, the world's most famous diamond. As lavish as the throne was, it would require just as much blood to obtain it. In 1658, Shah Jahan fell ill and his four sons picked up the sword, starting the Mughal War of Succession. 
In Mughal tradition, the princes were allowed to build power bases around the empire and they were expected to prepare for a fight against their brothers to claim the throne. Shah Jahan's favorite was the eldest, Darashiko, but he wasn't exactly the most capable general in the empire. That was Prince Aurangzeb. Aurangzeb defeated his brothers and had them executed. He then imprisoned his father, Shah Jahan, and coronated himself as emperor. Shah Jahan lived under house arrest till his death in 1666. Aurangzeb is, without a doubt, the most controversial of the Mughal emperors. He ruled for nearly five decades and was the last of the great Mughals. He's usually maligned as a bigot who cracked down on minorities and reversed the policies Akbar had created to integrate the Mughals into India. However, his negative aspects are often exaggerated to contrast with his great-grandfather Akbar. For instance, while it is true that he destroyed various Hindu temples, those temples were always associated with Aurangzeb's political enemies. While he did reinstate the jizya, which was a head tax collected from non-Muslims, he rarely collected it and contemporary Hindu sources complained not about the jizya but about the corruption of the officials who collected it. Also, among the Mughals, Aurangzeb had the largest percentage of Hindu court officials. He executed the ninth guru of the six, Guru Teg Bahadur, but again for political reasons. During Aurangzeb's time in the southern part of the Indian subcontinent, the seeds were sown for an empire that would, in the future, challenge the Mughals, the Maratha Empire. In the second half of his reign, Aurangzeb became obsessed with conquering the Deccan region of South India. He spent all that time away from the capital, held up in tent cities, commanding armies. While he was able to get a great amount of success against the Marathas, he wasn't able to fully destroy them. Being away from the capital at Delhi, Aurangzeb was disconnected from the richer provinces of the empire to the north, which allowed his vassals to build power without the emperor's oversight. The vassals were becoming too powerful and Aurangzeb was growing old. Unfortunately, the next generation of princes didn't inspire any hope either. Aurangzeb and his brothers had been trained by their father, but Aurangzeb didn't train his sons with the same dedication. Partly because Aurangzeb was afraid that his sons might depose him as he had done to his father. He grew too old and his trusted generals began dying. Aurangzeb had already reached the limits of his power when in the last few years he wasn't able to capture a single fort despite having the world's richest empire at his back. At the age of 88 in 1707, Aurangzeb died in the fort of Ahmednagar. At this point, his sons picked up their swords, but their war was quite small compared to the one Aurangzeb had fought against his brothers. When the dust settled, Bahadur Shah I ascended to the throne at the age of 64 or 65. During his reign, things had begun to slip and court intrigue reached such a level that in the last six months of his reign, the emperor just retired and began gardening. After him, we get a quick succession of Jahandar Shah, Farukh Siyar, Shah Jahan II and finally Rafiud Darjat before things calmed down with Muhammad Shah. The reason behind this quick succession was that the Turco-Mongol elites of the empire were now clashing with the newly powerful Indian Muslim elites. Unfortunately, the emperors weren't equipped to deal with all of this and so they became puppets at the hands of the elites. Muhammad Shah's reign saw the empire stabilizing a bit. He was able to bring some power back under his control. He was doing good until 1739 when the Iranian emperor Nadir Shah invaded India. Nadir Shah looted and sacked the empire. When he entered Delhi, Muhammad Shah had no choice but to greet him and open the gates. Despite this, Delhi was sacked and burned to the ground. Nadir Shah walked away with unimaginable wealth and the cherry on top, the peacock throne. It's said that because of the immense wealth he looted, Nadir Shah stopped taxation in his empire for three years. Before the invasion, there was a thin veneer of Mughal authority over North India. But after the invasion, it was clear that Mughal power had eroded and North India was up for grabs. Former Mughal vassals that had at least paid lip service to the emperor now refused to acknowledge his authority. In the west, Punjab walked away, while in the east, Bengal walked away. Bengal would soon be taken over by the British East India Company and much of the Mughal South was taken by the Marathas who had revitalized themselves into a formidable force. 
1757, Delhi itself fell to the Marathas, who turned the Mughal emperor into a tributary and established their power all the way to the border of modern-day Afghanistan. Over the next century, the Mughal emperor's power was limited to the walls of the Red Fort as first the Marathas and then the British East India Company pulled their strings. In 1764, the British East India Company defeated the Mughal Empire, being ruled by Shah Alam II at the Battle of Baksar. The emperor had to give the British the right to collect taxes from pretty much everywhere east of Delhi. In the following decades, the British fought both the Marathas and the French to gain control of most of the Indian subcontinent. Finally, in 1857, when the Mughal Empire was being ruled, and I'm being very generous with that term here, by Bahadur Shah II, there was a rebellion against the British East India Company. Indian troops had been riled up by the introduction of a new type of rifle cartridge. This cartridge had to be chewed off before loading and unfortunately the paper that had to be chewed off was greased with the fat of both pigs and cows. Pigs, as you might know, are haram and forbidden to Muslims while cows, as you might know, are sacred and forbidden to Hindus. The British Indian troops revolted into a very disorganized rebellion and appealed to Bahadur Shah II to be the leader of the revolution. While in practice the Mughals held no real power, they still held enough prestige to be accepted by the people. Bahadur Shah agreed and held court for the first time in decades. However, in the end, Indian troops lost and Bahadur Shah II was deposed by the British in 1857, ending the Mughal Empire. While today the Mughals are being vilified in India by the ruling party and its Hindutva ideology, it is no exaggeration to say that the Mughals gave a lot to the country as well. Under Shah Jahan and Aurangzeb, the Mughal Empire contributed something like 25% of the world's GDP and was the richest empire on the planet. Many of the things that we eat today on the Indian subcontinent were introduced by the Mughals, including the great dish of biryani. Not to mention, it was a Mughal, specifically the last Mughal, that gave patronage to Mirza Ghalib, arguably the greatest poet of the Urdu language. So that was a quick overview of the Mughal dynasty of India. If you want to buy the poster, you can head over to our website, usefulcharts.com. Thank you for watching.